Yeah. I think the, the most pressing and important question is this first one uh, from Tomas Granas about yeah. Lego. Uh, he asked, what's your favorite Lego theme? Yeah, so uh, my favorite Lego theme is something that not a lot of people know. It's called Ideas. Okay. And so basically you can submit if you have an idea of a new Lego set that should be built. Then people can upvote. And then if it gets enough upvotes... Uh, then they build it. And so one of the set that I just got is three birds. Seems boring, but <laughs> they're actually super beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and they came from a random person submitting this idea. That's so cool. Yeah, so I cool. was just reading an AMA the other day with a Lego master builder. Did you see that one on Reddit? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I look at it. Uh, you probably knew all that stuff. <laughs> um, what kind of birds are they? Uh, I So that will be really hard for me to not tell you in French. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's next level in uh, my learning of English. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I know what front is just because I've been around YC, but uh, for, for the average person who doesn't know what it is, how would you describe it? Um, so I would describe it as a shared inbox. So you can think about it as... You know what Gmail or Outlook does, but we've added collaboration features and mm -hmm. workflows so that it works be it works better for teams. So we have a few different kinds of teams that are using the product from recruiting teams, support teams, account management teams, client services teams, operations teams. And what they have in common is they have a lot of emails coming in and inside their company, a lot of people inside the team that needs to handle these emails mm -hmm. and they struggle managing that as a team because email wasn't made for teams so mm -hmm. that's what we do and when did you add the the personal email to it uh actually pretty early on really? so yeah <laughs> so the thing is it wasn't working that well so um meaning you weren't getting users yeah meaning in order to have a product that people will use for their individual emails yeah. you need to get to a level of feature parity with gmail or outlook that's pretty intense. And so even if you could do it four years ago, it's only about two years ago that we started having the features that would allow people to manage both shared inboxes and individual inboxes as well. So today we have, I think, 40% of our daily active users who are using Front both for shared inboxes and individual inboxes. Hmm. And we're releasing a brand new version of Front at the end of October that we've been working on for nine months. <laughs> Uh, and the goal is to make sure that people can enjoy the individual inbox mm -hmm. as much as they enjoy the shared inbox. Can you be more specific? Meaning, so today when you have a shared inbox, let's say support at sales mm -hmm. at, it's obvious that they require collaboration. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you would not have a shared inbox. But for individual inbox, so matilda.frontlab.com, they also require collaboration. So I will collaborate with my assistant, with our sales team on specific deals, with our recruiting team and specific candidates, uh, with our product team and product feedback. And if, so tomorrow with Front, you can also add your individual inbox, like Matilda front app, and then assign messages, have internal conversations around these messages, integrate it with whatever tool you're using, so GitHub, Salesforce, Trello, Asana, et cetera. So it becomes a full replacement for Gmail or Outlook. Got you, okay. How do you feel about a Gmail, or rather Google wrapping up inbox? Uh, I think it's zero surprising. Okay. Um, so, I mean, so first of all, I wasn't a huge fan of Inbox. I think Inbox brought a few things that were great, like they grouped notifications, they had great snooze features. But I think that if you want people to change how they uh, deal with email, the amount of innovation that you need to bring needs to be super high because it's very disruptive to change. So then the value proposition needs to be like, it needs to be 10x better. Hmm. And I didn't feel like Inbox was 10x better than Gmail. Hmm. So I'm not surprised. And then when they rolled out their new Gmail version and uh, like you could see that it was pretty similar, then yeah. I, th I I knew that uh, that was coming. It kind of brought over the better stuff. Yeah, and, and then also... If you are going to have two different products doing the same thing, then they should be super different, mm. and they weren't super different. Mm. Did you find that when you, when you started to integrate individual emails into front, the people were asking for like all these like vestigial features of Gmail that you're like, this is going to be ended at some point, but they still want it? Yeah, I think there are, you know, there are, f so yes, they want a lot of features, but I think that's normal and we should provide them. There are a few ones that are harder to implement just because I can't be convinced that they're better for the world. <laughs> so for example, you know, sub sub folders, like, okay, and you can try to build Outlook again and maybe <laughs> it's the best thing or maybe it's not. Yeah, mm, okay. Um, 
how, how did you end up weighing that out? Like it was just if enough customers complained that you're or enough people like gave you friction about signing up, you would build it. Um, so I mean, the question I, I saw that a lot of people ask on Twitter questions about how do you prioritize features? Yeah. So like I can talk a little bit more yeah. about that. Um, so there is one thing that's unique that we did, which so we did it in YC four years ago. We built a Trello roadmap mm -hmm. and we made it public. So we're like, here is everything we're thinking about building. And you can upload the thing that you want and you can see what we're working on and you can see what has been shipped. So that gave us a ton of insight on what people wanted. The second thing that we did was, so obviously we use Front to manage uh, incoming inquiries, but any tool that you're using should be able to provide analytics on the kind of requests that your users have. So you should be able to see in the past month, for example, I don't know, 20% of, uh, of incoming inquiries were about folders or better analytics or whatever. So then we can look at that. And then arrives the moment where like you have so many inputs Plus, that's there is also what I personally believe we should build, mm -hmm. and you need to make a decision. And I feel like the decision will be um, uh, will be based on two things. One is what's the um, intensity or how much complexity uh, it is to build a certain feature, and then is like what's the uptake? Like what can we expect from it? Will it? Uh, I don't know. Increase our market? Will it make our current users? happier, will they pay more, etc. And so you always need to balance these two things. And so for us, we just have a scale of one to three. So like in terms of how good it will be for our users, one, two, three, like game changer or like slightly better, nice to have. Yeah. And then how complex is it to build? And so then you have nine different scores depending on these three things. And that's how we can prioritize what we built. Hmm. Um, and we should always put that in perspective of what our... Uh, one, what our vision is and making sure that we're not doing something that's against what we want to build. Um, and then making sure that we remain focused because I think that one of the biggest things that you need to achieve when you're small mm -hmm. is being super focused. Mm. And of those features you've rolled out in the past four years, were there certain ones where you really noticed a giant uptick in usage or growth or... Yeah. Or in, yeah. So there is um, there is one way that we released uh, where it's really changed how Front was used. So... And it's specific to what we do, but basically the concept of front is whenever you have a message that comes in, you can comment on it. So you have an email and you can have internal discussions about it. You have a tweet, you can have internal discussions about it. And so before you could comment on one specific uh, message. So if you had like three messages, you could decide to comment on message one or message two or message three. The bad thing about that is it was really hard to have a conversation that was flowing mm, because mm -hmm. you could comment on message one and then someone comment on message but three. But then a new email came in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, but we wanted to um, let people have conversations that were fluid around. So we decided to do two things. One is reverse the order of uh, conversations. So now the most recent is at the bottom and not at the top. And then that would allow us to have conversations not associated to any message anymore, but that would just flow into the conversation. Mm. And so that was a huge disruption because when people use email like five hours a day and they've built workflows around <laughs> commenting on messages and you're introducing that huge change, then yeah. they're pretty upset. But then what we saw is the number of comments that was made per daily active users, that was growing that way and then it grew that way. And so um, I feel like most of the decisions, product decision that we made that led to like a significant change in behavior yeah. were the most painful. Mm. And, and another example is we're releasing a new version of France in October. Like I can't tell you how upset our customers are going to be. <laughs> and I can't tell you how excited I am that we're rolling this out, but it's going to be super disruptive. So a bunch of people had questions about like how you guys were when, you know, getting customers in the early days. Yeah. So I think what would be helpful is for context, like what did Front look like when you yeah. guys launched? Because I'm sure it's different now. Yeah. I mean, so the so Front sucked when we launched yeah. it. Like I remember we were in YC and our 
uh, batchmates would come to me and ask, can I use the product? And I was like, no, you should use a competitor. <laughs> like our product is really not as great. So like it wasn't great, but you should launch it like as soon as possible because that's how you'll get feedback and that's you want feedback in order to make sure that you're making something people want. So the product was bad. Um, now what I remember is building an MVP in the email space is tough because people expect a lot of features. Like they will expect attachments to work. They will expect tags to work. You should be able to CC people, BCC people, forward emails, etc. So basically what we did was we had like the most basic version of front without attachments, like, but we would still try to see if some innovation that we had brought where you could assign emails to people and have comments would be enough for people to give up on a few of the features. Mm -hmm. And I remember that something that we did when Front was super early is I was writing a lot of content. And so I think probably our first 300 customers were coming from content that I was writing on like Medium or and then sharing on Hacker News or guest posts or on our blog Mm -hmm. and writing about email, which I think was a topic that people liked reading about or like communication, collaboration, Slack, like things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then people would sign up to our beta and then I would call them and manually onboard them and try to have them use the product. And then they would use the product for maybe a few hours and then stop using the product. But then I would know why. Then I would, you know, talk to my co-founder and tell him we're <laughs> one feature away, like at a trance and, and, and then we're good. Then we would build it. And then I would talk to customers and they were like, no, that's missing. So then <laughs> one feature away. And really the only things we did for the f- first year at least was just doing that. It was, writing content, onboarding users, and building features. And every other distraction that you could think of, yeah. we didn't do. Okay. So I was emailing with Wade from Zapier yeah. about their content marketing. Uh, Kat and I are doing a class at Startup School this week. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> one thing he said, which I thought was really interesting, was in the beginning they found themselves getting trapped by writing content that would do well on Hacker News, yeah. but not actually convert to users for them. Yeah. Were you able to differentiate that in the beginning or were you just trying to get any kind of attention? So it might be true. The truth is, like, first of all, I had no other idea. So yes, in an ideal world, I would find a legion source that's as effective as possible. Yeah. I knew nothing about paid acquisition. Shared inbox is not something people are looking for. So I felt like that wasn't working. We had a horizontal product and we weren't sure who were, who was going to use it. So like outbounding wasn't uh-huh. necessarily the best thing because you're like, uh, we have this general <laughs> tool. Um, and so for me, yes, the truth is I would agree with them. Like we, uh-huh. I think from our beta, we had 3000 companies that signed up to, um, to our product. And I think, I don't know. 10 of them ended up using our product. So the conversion rate is not high. But no. anytime I was uh, onboarding someone and the person was not interested, I learned a ton. And so if I were to do it again, I think I would do it again just because that was my best guess mm. to have a lot of people signing up. And then I had a few tricks. Like whenever you were signing up, you had an auto reply that said, why are you why are you interested? What problem are you trying to solve? And so even if, you know, they don't end up converting, then you get a ton of information. Mm, So at scale, content is not at all how we get users today, but in the early days, or at least it's still some of the way we get users, but not the main source, which is, which is pet acquisition versus, um, in the early days, it was the main source for us to get users. And, I don't regret it. I don't think it was scalable, but I think it was doable and yeah. uh, confronted us with the market. What was the most successful piece? Uh, it's like a email will last forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of like this opinionated yeah. essay. Type it was thing. a lot of thought leadership and a lot of sharing my journey as a founder. And how far did that get you? So you know, you you said you know, out of three thousand companies, you got. 10 maybe how did you get to so we hired our first marketing person uh in january 2017 so two and a half years after we launched the product so so that's where it uh got us so pr and content was 
90% of what we did in the first two and a half years. Which is how and many customers roughly? So it got us to probably 1 million in AR. And so that was probably a thousand customers, maybe hmm. something like that. That's great. Yeah. Wow. Um, no, less than that. Less customers. Yes. 500. <laughs> yeah. it's, you you guys started making this in some kind of like startup lab thing, right? Wasn't oh was yeah, that, yeah yeah? Can you talk more about that? Because we we haven't had someone on the podcast that's been through one of those. Yeah. So uh, when I graduated, I uh, joined a startup, uh, and then I knew that I wanted to start a company. But I think for me, the main thing is I had to borrow money to uh, go to school. Yeah. And then I had to give back the money. And so starting a company <laughs> was pretty tough. So I took a job in a SaaS company and I was doing sales because I feared that I could probably make a lot of money if I was doing my job right. Um, and so two things happened. One is I made uh, some money, so that was good. <laughs> and two is I learned more about SaaS and softwares okay. and I loved it. Like I, I really loved the idea of building a product that could then be used by some people and then their life at work would be drastically different because of the product that we had built. So it was, at that point I was uh, working on a contract management software mm -hmm. and contracts are super archaic and then they had this beautiful tool and I thought it was wonderful, but I was not using contracts. I was using email and I was as frustrated with this tool that had not evolved in the past 10 years was clearly wasn't made for businesses. Yeah. So a year after I joined the company, I was lucky enough to meet with this. So they're called eFounders. They are a startup studio. And what they do is they either um, find technical co-founders or business uh, co-founders and they try to have people meet. And then if, you know, a great relationship comes out of it, then they are happy to um, fund them. Mm. And so that's where I met with my co-founder, Laurent. And so when I think about my journey at front, like where I got most lucky was meeting with them, uh, with him. Uh, and with them uh, <laughs> five years ago. And so I met him and for two months... Um, but wait, wait, wait. How, how did you meet? Was it some kind of like speed dating situation? No, it's like they host events. I eventually quit my job and so okay. I spend a lot of time in their startup studio helping on lots of different projects. And uh, Laurent was there and gotcha. it was the same thing. Like he had quit his job, uh, was working on one specific project, met him... Um, and then really liked him. Um, and I think the thing that we tried to do for two months was asking ourselves all these tough questions that can happen in the journey of two founders. Like, what happens if I want to fire you or you want to fire me or you want to sell and I don't want to sell or like whatever, should we have the same ownership in the company and things like that? Like, would you move to San Francisco? And, <laughs> and I think we agreed on everything. And so then after two months, we were like, okay, let's do it. And it worked out so well. So it was super lucky. Uh, but so I think for us, a startup studio was great for two reasons. One, the fact that we met. And two, the fact that we got initial funding. Mm. Now, a few months after we met, we decided to go to YC where mm -hmm. we got additional funding. And so then we weren't very uh, close to them. So it was super great in the first few months. And then... YC was great, and then other things were great. <laughs> Everything's great. Um, At different stage of the company. Yeah. I'm sure things were painful, too. Yes. Um, did, yeah, yeah, yeah. So did, you, did the idea come about before you even joined? So yeah. France is... Um, the, at the intersection of two things. One is I was willing to uh, innovate in the email space. And Laurent, my co-founder, uh, had been in two companies before where they had a lot of users. They were um, forced to implement help desk solutions like uh, Zendesk or Freshdesk, etc. Hated them. And so like what he wanted to build was a lightweight uh, support tool. And so in fact, like front uh, started as this email tool, but with a go-to-market being shared in boxes. Mm -hmm. And the reason was because 
Laurent wanted to do that. I wanted to do that. We thought, okay, but email is impossible to start from scratch. Like no company has managed to build a business starting with an email product because super hard to build, super hard to uh, have people pay for it. So I was like, okay, what if the go-to market is shared inboxes, but then we expand, as we discussed, into like a full email client that can be used by um individuals and teams and that's why front is this combination of like this very big vision but this very simple pain point mm, that we mm-hmm. address at the beginning mm. and just to go back really quickly what have been the hardest moments so far of front yeah i mean uh so i can share one that's business related then the one that's uh more <laughs> personal so uh, 18 months ago, uh, my co-founder was diagnosed with a cancer. So that was, uh, the hardest moment by far. And so then when I reflect on the journey, you know, it's really hard to say, oh, this moment where, I don't know, we didn't get the term sheet we wanted or like this big customer churn. Like, it's really hard for me to tell that it was the like hardest moment because that's far harder than anything you can conceive. And now is, uh, great. And so. All of it was turned out in a super positive outcome. Uh, but I think when that happened, it was like my lowest. Mm-hmm. And then you start to realize that, you know, like founders are always very committed to making their company work and that's good, but they should also realize that, you know, their company is just a company and you have a life outside of your company that's also super important and you should enjoy every moment that you have because you know things could be very different tomorrow. Yeah, and so. how do you how do you maintain that balance? I mean, you like goof around with Legos, play soccer. So <laughs> I, I mean, I'm so when I'm super deliberate myself, and then I try to implement a lot of things at front to promote this healthy work life balance. And yeah. clearly, it's been influenced by the fact that Laurent got sick. And um, so I personally meditate every day. Um, I log out of every app, Slack, Front, etc. every weekend and anytime I'm on PTO. I don't have any notifications, so I'm never distracted by uh, by work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I exercise, like I play soccer, I run, I kitesurf, I bike. Um, and I just make sure that like when I stay late at the office, it's an exception. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sometimes do it. And when I work during the weekend, it's an exception as well. So that's what I do personally in order to make sure. And I sleep like at least eight hours a night every mm-hmm. night. Um, that was like the biggest game changer for me, actually, oh, yeah. in terms of like feeling better. I know it's like so dumb and obvious, but just like prioritizing that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've uh, always done that and I've yeah. always felt uh, more proactive. Um, and then... You know, at front, there are a few things. So last week we had health and wellness week and every day you could meditate so that you could like understand what it does. And then we had lunch and learn explaining the impact of eating healthy on your emotions. And I don't know, we organized a few runs. And so also whenever people join, I explain what front is about and I explain that I care about it. So that's Mm. in our culture as well. Yeah. And you just kind of try and lead by example. Yeah. In the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And in the hard moment for your company, what was that? Uh, I mean, so the thing is, so every single moment is super hard. And so one of my biggest learnings from YC four years ago when, you know, the company was super small and every Tuesday we had people coming and talking about all kinds of things. And we had the founders of Stripe, of Facebook, of Optimizely, of Dropbox, like, which are super successful companies. And they were telling us how hard it was and how many times they've wondered whether the business would go anywhere. I mean, that's the story of my life. Like, you know, (laughs) it's super easy to think about Front as, you know, this company that has, you look at our metrics because I've published everything. We've consistently uh, been doing well in terms of revenue. Our retention of employees is high. Look, You look at our funding stories. We've always raised money super easily. Okay, cool. Like, that's what you can read about it. The truth is every single day I wake up and there is a list of 10 questions where I don't have answers and I need to figure them out. And I know that the more we grow, the more is at stake. And so I absolutely need to find the answers. And so every single day is hard and we still have customers that churn and I'm extremely sad about it. We still have employee situations that are not easy to deal with. Um, I still have, you know, moments where I'm wondering uh, if we should do what we're doing. Mm. Um, And 
that's true for every single founder I've ever met, as successful as they are. And so I think nobody should wonder whether like it's hard or easy. Like it's just consistently hard. And do you need help reminding yourself of that, or were the dinners enough? Um, no, so I read, a, you know, the hard things about hard things. I mean, every, a lot of founders have read the book, but for me, it was like really game changer to just read about the fact that it's hard. You should stop wondering about it. Yeah. Just a given. It doesn't mean anything about the health of your company. Yeah. Um, so I just need to remind myself that it's normal and it's, it's just a job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you, you said something interesting about retention. Uh, I know that's like something you guys are particularly good at and, and proud of, I'm sure. Yes. Um, do you have kind of pro tips in that category? Yeah. So I'm preparing a talk about that. So I'm, okay. um, I've been thinking about it. Um, so here is, I think it's a super complex question because if the answer was... Snacks. Let's do that <laughs> and you'll have a great retention of employees. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but we have yeah. super high retention and super high NPS inside the company. So I, I think that there are three categories of things you can do within your company to make sure that that's happening. The first one is like, how do you hook people? And I think that's by having a mission driven company. So at the end of the day, so I was asked to do a talk about mm -hmm. uh, retention. And so then I emailed our employees and I was like, at the end of the day, why are you engaged, motivated, happy? Why do you work hard? Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. a lot of them were saying, because we care about the mission. And, and so I think you need to make sure that you have a mission. It's clear. People can interpret it in the way they want. Our mission statement is work happier. And, you know, it means different things for different people. But if people can relate to it and can feel like, you know, they have a purpose when working on front, then it's good. So making it super clear and as your company scale, just making sure that you say it over and over and everyone knows what it means, everyone has examples of what it means, is super important. Then I think that the then there is like the push, what will um, enable them to go above and beyond. And I think that um, for that, it's really the quality of coworkers. So um, one advice that Patrick Ellison gave me when I was hiring our first employees was two things. One, when you hire your first employees, you should think about every person that you bring with a bar that's as high as, could this person be my co-founder? Mm -hmm. And that was super helpful because then you uh, hire people that like, are really great at the beginning. And then the second advice he gave me was when you hire someone, you should wonder whether you want 10 person like this in, in your company. Uh, because the truth is they will hire people like them. And so then if you don't want 10 people like this, then you should probably not hire this person. And so I think we did a really good job in the early days at hiring super talented people that were a really good match with our values. And so then as we grew the team, like I think the team became really good mm -hmm. and good meaning they're talented, but also they are, we have some values. We, uh, they are low ego, high standards, collaborative, caring. And, um, and I think that making sure that even when you're desperate to hire people, you don't lower your bar and you've heard it so much, but like, it's so important. Um, that's, I think something that contributes to us having a really good culture. And I like to think about every single employee that we bring as someone bringing something new on top of, you know, all the baseline, the baseline being here. Mm. So that, and then the third thing is, I think, so People want to see and understand that they have an impact because if they care about the vision and the mission and, um, and they have great coworkers, so they want to do their best, but they don't sure how to contribute, then at the end of the day, they will probably not, uh, do as good of a job or be as happy. And so for that, I think there are like a lot of things that you can implement within your company. So one of them is transparency. So, it's a word that's being used a lot, but it's super easy to claim that you're a transparent company and super hard to implement and it gets just harder as you scale. Um, so for us, being transparent means you have dashboards that show everything. Every Monday morning, we go over all our metrics. Every quarter, I do a presentation. Last quarter at front, I review mm -hmm. everything that has been going mm -hmm. well, not going well. Every board meeting, I send the board deck. Every, I don't know, every... 
uh, inbox is accessible in front. So you want to see what customers want to say, like good things and bad things, you can access it. If you want to see why uh, a candidate uh, didn't accept an offer, you can know why. Like whatever you want to, if you want to know what's our runway, you can also know what's our runway. And when you say every inbox is accessible, does that mean personal inboxes as well? No. So personal okay. inboxes, usually they're, so if you are a manager, you have access to uh, your direct reports inboxes. And the truth is I tried, we tried uh, to make, so we tried to make as many inboxes as possible public. But the truth is you have to implement some rules because, I don't know, there are HR um, emails that should not be shared. There are financial emails that should not be shared. So we try to share as much of the like personal emails, like yeah. uh, name at company.com as possible, but not 100% not are, are, are shared. So I think transparency is just like a really good way to have people understand what the impact of their work is on all these metrics that are displayed. Mm. Um, so <laughs> these are a few tips. Yeah. W what else don't you share? So the way I think about transparency is if something is going to create more problems and raise more questions, then bad use of transparency is something is going to answer a lot of questions and solve a lot of problems, then good use of transparency. So what, what don't we share? We don't share the salaries of everyone. It's why. So I, I can give you an example. There is like a person at front that might have health issues and our insurance doesn't cover it. So we might pay this person an additional, I don't know, a few hundred do dollars a month um, instead of paying for the insurance. And so then if everything was public and then people would be like, whoa, yeah, why is yeah. this person paid as much? And then I would have to explain. And so that's, and I don't care, like it doesn't bring anything great to the company. So the way I think about um, compensation is if anyone knew everything tomorrow, I could explain mm -hmm. and it's fair. And that's what matters. Now it doesn't mean that I will share it mm. because it's actually not super helpful. Okay. Um, and I mean, another example is, you know, when people leave or are let go, um, usually we don't share why. And we try to be super transparent about our performance process, mm. making sure that people understand why someone might be let go and making sure that it's fair. Now, privacy of employees is more important than transparency. And so then transparency doesn't mean that I will share oh, this person wasn't good at doing this and that, and that's right. why we let this person go. Right. And so do you guys now have employees overseas as well? You yes. have an office in France? Yeah, so we decided to open an office in Paris in January this year, and so now we have about 20% of our team in Paris and 80% here. Okay, and now how do you go about making them feel included? Um, same thing, we're super deliberate about it. So every employee in France starts with an onboarding in San Francisco. Twice a year, we have company-wide offsites and everyone is coming. We have all hands where we make sure that it's a balance between SF sharing insights and Paris sharing insights. My co-founder went back to France. So like having one founder in each team is mm. super important. We have a lot of people from SF who, tra who go to Paris gotcha. so that they can also share more about the culture here and so far it's working really well i mean we're still improving a lot of things but that's and he's there full-time now yeah oh okay that's great yeah yeah that that's helps cool a lot uh yeah it helps a ton um you got a ton of questions on twitter uh yeah <laughs> uh i there was one that i wanted to bring up now um so kp asks what is one unique insight about the problem, meaning the problem you're working on, uh, you didn't have at the start, but only discovered later after launching? Yeah. So I think um, there are a few things. One thing that I always find interesting is you know, one of the uh, reasons why I think we were successful building an email product, and I mean successful so far, is because we actually had, no, we didn't have a lot of insights. So, you know, I had been working for a year, and so it's not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, I think, and, and my co-founder was uh, very technical, so didn't use email like many, many hours uh, every day or had not built any email product. Yeah. And I think having, you know, a new pair of eyes on this program that has, 
I, I mean, has existed for like ever, I think was something that was really good. So, you know, when people sometimes ask questions about the insights that you have and other people don't have, something, so sometimes the fact that you don't have any insight and you have a, like, a, a, new pair of eyes is actually super insightful. Now, the truth is everything that we discovered about France is things that I didn't know before. So, for example, we have these use cases where logistics companies and travel companies love front. I knew nothing about these industries. <laughs> and now I'm going to tracking conferences and I understand exactly how they work. And so I think it's just, we've been super, super honest with ourselves mm -hmm. on what we knew and what we didn't know. And then talking with our potential customers so much to understand their insights. And so the way I would answer this question is the truth is 99% of what I know today, I didn't know when I started. Right. I just felt like for sure something could be improved in that space. And I felt like we had a good team to do it. That's the only thing I knew. <laughs> I mean, you were committed to the problem. Right? I was committed like, to the problem. But I, was, yeah. I, I cared more about, like, I want people to be more efficient at work. And I feel like email is the tool that people use to get work done. And so I care about that more than, you know, adding collaboration to email or assigning emails or commenting on emails. Like, no, I care about people spend their lives in their inbox. Yeah. And this tool has not evolved in the past 10 years. And it was not made for businesses. So for sure, something can be improved. Mm -hmm. TBD how? <laughs> Let's start with shared inboxes. Did you guys, yeah. Did you guys consider other options before you really started building front? Uh, no. No. Uh, oh, wow. Like we, we knew that we would start with shared inboxes. Um, one, one funny story that, um, I sometimes share when I go to YC for dinners is, um, we, we try to have these insights. Like we were looking for them. So for example, uh, PB, uh, who created Gmail was, uh, is one of the partners at YC. And yeah. so when I joined YC, I was super excited to meet with him yeah. and I was like, so here are all our ideas. <laughs> so we can go in this direction, this direction, this direction. What do you think we should do? And I was like, follow your growth. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, thanks. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I took t to all my friends about the fact that I was like, uh, meeting with the <laughs> person who created Gmail. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, that's the best advice he could give us because you know he has some insights on like what Prime Gmail was trying to solve, but that's very different from what France is trying to solve, and that's like a different time uh, in in history and a different set of problems. Yeah, I mean, he also. Well, I mean, there are multiple ways to tackle this, but like there's so much pattern matching that happens at YC yeah. that like you, it's almost like you don't want to get too prescriptive yeah. with this stuff because you can negatively pattern match yeah, 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 and for build sure. the wrong thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's another question. Uh, Jordan Jackson asks, email, at least for me, has taken on a different meaning in life uh, in the context of like messaging apps and chat platforms. Um, it is almost more serious in a way. How do you see email evolving and the ecosystem that encompasses it in people's lives? Yeah. So, I mean, so I think it's a good question because you hear so much for from companies like Slack, for example, email is dead. Yeah. And yeah. So here's like the way you think about email is first of all, for your personal emails. So like you're emailing friends and families. I, I don't think that email will last forever. So if you look at the growth year over year, it's actually decreasing every year. Whereas if you look at work emails, it's increasing year over year. So um, I believe that email will remain in a work environment. I'm not convinced about your personal life. And I think like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and all these other uh, tools can actually be better mm. um, or be used far more than they used to. Now, in a work environment, um, I feel like email the protocol is actually perfect because it's the only protocol that you can use to communicate with people outside your company. And so even if you have great tools like Slack that enable you to Slack in to message people internally, yeah. um, the truth is it will not solve 90% of your communication, which is happening externally. And however, I think the interfaces for email is not, or like are not perfect. So the protocol is great, interface is not great. And so 
if you have a tool that has a good interface and can be inspired by other apps that are doing amazing, like Slack is great because they have a really delightful product that's really fast that mm -hmm. works cross-platform. Um, and I think if you can apply some of the things that made these companies or these tools successful and apply them to a protocol that, in my opinion, is the best, then I strongly believe that people could spend 90% of their time in their inbox mm. versus today it's probably not as high as 90%. No. It, if you could like wipe everyone's memory of email context and like restart, what would you wipe out and like create a new? Like if I was to start a, like a new e email If you could product? just like delete email from everyone's mind and just have, all right, this is the new email product. Yeah, so, you know, I think um, I would probably wipe out most of the structural features because when you think about, you know, the main things are you have a subject, you have a signature, you literally carbon copy and blind carbon copy. And <laughs> yeah. I, so I think I would remove all of that. So I don't think you need a subject. I don't think you need, you should see CBCC forward, reply all these things. Uh, but I would keep the fact that uh, it's universal and you can have a message that's being sent somewhere else. Um, and then that's what I would do. So I would so it'd be similar to SMS. Uh, yeah, but I, then the, the tricky thing is SMS has zero concept of workflow. So you still need workflows. And so, for example, everything around the fact that you can assign messages, you can share a message and you can collaborate on a draft, you can comment internally, you can uh, create automation and say if then. Like, that's super important that doesn't exist in SMS. But today, these features, CC, BCC, for, like, are used as workflows, yeah. whereas really they're not designed for that, so then that leads to a lot of inefficiencies. Okay, uh, so there were just a handful of other questions about product market fit that yeah. I feel like, I think um, it's funny because based on the the startup school lectures, I think like the, the questions are changing with every yeah. week and there were just a bunch on product market fit. Um, when did you guys feel like you hit it? Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, very late, actually. So I mean, oh, when right. when we um, when we raised our seed, uh, we had just a few numbers. I think we we're doing like 10k MR, so like not a lot. We might have I don't know, a few like a hundred companies using the product, um, and clearly, I didn't feel great. Like <laughs> I've you know it was ultimately a good investment, but I didn't feel like we had product market fit. Yeah. And I think when we raised our Series A, and so we raised our Series A, we were making, I think, 1.5 million in AR, um, so a little over 100K MR. I think that's where when I felt like some companies were using the product, and even if I had demoed all the alternatives, yeah. Front was actually a better solution for them. And I think that's, and then I felt like the market was big, but didn't really know how big, but at least big enough. Um, and I think so that's, and so that was in, in three years after we started. So pretty long time. Yeah. Took a while. Yeah. And so when founders, I, I mean, imagine like you've given talks and stuff. Now people are asking you for advice and like yeah. when they're looking to find it, what do you, what do you tell them? What do you, or what do you even point them to, to read? Uh, like advice on product market fit mm -hmm. or advice in general? Product market fit. Uh, so like the thing is at the end of the day, like you need to be convinced that you're doing something that people want. Okay. And so I feel like you need to be, and it's a piece of advice that I share in general, like you need to be so brutally honest with yourself and with your team about what's working and not working. I think startups are so hard that there is almost like as a human being, you, you want to be happy. And so you don't necessarily want to face every reality because it can be really hard. And so, you know, if you're working... 12 hours a day and the thing that you keep hearing is ah, I'm not super interested in your product whatever and then at a point someone says oh it's pretty good then you anchor so much on like, the fact that someone said it's pretty good yeah. and then you tend to ignore the fact that yes but 95% told you that it was not good um, and and so I think you know making sure that you the only things you do is talking to people using the product 
talking to people that might be interested in using the product and then building things so yeah. that these two things can change and then communicating that or sharing this information with your team uh, and having one metric in place that will show you whether you're making progress or not. So for us, it was revenue because we felt like if people were willing to use the product, they would pay for it. Uh, that's the only thing that matters. And, and that's the focus you need to have. Both like in your head, you need to make sure that you're super honest. Yeah. And also from just a process and communication standpoint, like you should make sure that, you know, every single day you share how many more users revenue, like whatever you have. Every single week you can calculate your growth and you can look at it because, I mean, I think it's PG who said that, but the first way to have anything increase is to look at it and like just be super honest about about it yeah i think that's true across the board people yeah. are you're scared of the truth um i i'm curious about all this in the context of your your meditation practice yeah um what does that look like on a daily basis and, and have you been doing this for a long time so i've been meditating for every day for i think 500 days so it's uh, like not forever but now quite a long time yeah um so, I mean, 500 days is uh, when my co-founder was sick. So it oh, was like a you more... You literally started that so day? So it was a more challenging period of my life where I think I was overwhelmed. But I think whether I was overwhelmed for that reason or other reasons, I think like when you're a founder in general, I, I'm pretty convinced that 99.9% .9 of founders would benefit from meditating every day. Um, so that was the trigger, but I wish I had known before. Yeah. Um, so... The the good thing about meditation is that as boring as it sounds and, you know, I have, I think, an active mind and so I don't like not <laughs> thinking about anything for 10 minutes. I do 10 minutes every morning. So that's it. So again, like your process is like yeah. you wake up so and you I just wake like up, get in it. No. So I wake up, have a shower because okay. otherwise I fall asleep when I'm meditating. <laughs> so <laughs> I wake up, okay. have a shower and then meditate for 10 minutes. Do you meditate? Do you have like a pillow? You like sit down on something? What do you do? No, I'm in, I have a couch in my living room. Okay. And I just sit there. Great. So I meditate 10 and minutes. You just sit. Yeah, I just sit and I have an app, uh, Headspace. Okay. Uh, and you, so you do a guided meditation. Guided meditation. Um, and then 10 minutes and then put my stuff on and then leave for work. How long did you have to do it before you felt that it was effective? So uh, many weeks. I think, you know, it's nothing magical. It's really like, it's really a muscle that you're training. And as anything, like you will notice the results in probably a few weeks or a few months, mm -hmm. not a few hours or a few days. But the, really the, the thing that I get out of it is now when an issue arises, it's like, okay, cool. The issue is here. Before it was, okay, so it's 90% of what's in my head. It's like taking all my attention. I'm super upset. Nothing can make me less um, upset just because I constantly think about it. And now I feel like the, like I, there is a distance. Like it's really like headspace is the name and really what it gave me is more headspace. And I can identify all the things that I need to do. Yeah. And there are different elements and doesn't prevent me from being upset, but then I can, I feel like context switch more easily and be in another state of mind for another set of problems. Fascinating, right? It's awesome. No, I've, I've gotten into a little bit. I've, I've always found that like exercise has been my like go-to strategy. Yeah. Um, but it's, I've done some meditation. It's a, it's a little bit different. It's very different. Yeah. I do both. You do both. Yeah, yeah, it's very different. Yeah. There are only so many hobbies yeah. and habits that you can like motivate yourself to keep up. Sure, but 10 minutes a day is something that you can do. Of course. And and I feel like it's I, at least every everyone should try for a few weeks because I feel like it can be such a game changer. But it's like it's clearly a discipline that you need to have that's really hard to have. Yeah, absolutely. But you just got to want it yeah. and then you do it. Yes. Um, this has been great. Thank you for coming in. Of course. Thank you for having me.